WCBI News at 6 starts now. Good evening, everyone. To demolish or not, it's a big question surrounding a more than 100-year-old Columbus home. Right now, the decision is in a holding pattern. Our Jory Talley joins us live in Columbus with more. Jory. The Columbus Redevelopment Authority owns this home and the property it sits on over here at the Burns Bottom District. The group recently purchased this property that is located along five other blocks in the area that the group is planning on to do for a project, a redevelopment project. Now, the, the future of this home is at a standstill because there's a debate about its past. This home was built in the early 1800s, but has been vacant for quite some time. Its prime has come and sadly gone. Now, its future is a subject of conversation. It is old, but is it historically significant? Um, and that's what the Department of Archives and History will have to determine. So, um, you, you know, at this point, it's, uh, we're looking at it. Um, it's an eyesore. Um, it's dangerous. Um, vandals have already gone in. They're stealing property out of it. The Columbus Redevelopment Authority says their research shows the home is not registered as a historic landmark, which is why they had plans to move forward with demolition. CRA Board President John Acker says they believe they took all the right steps to do that, but it was recently presented to them that that might not be the case. I think the biggest thing, the, the facts on this, is this home was not uh, in the deed, the property deed. There was no historical registry. Uh, so when we did our due diligence and our, our legal folks looked at it, they said, hey, there's nothing on the deed that says this has any historical significance. So uh, that's what we went by. Historian Rufus Ward says the house does, in fact, sit on the National Register of Historic Places. Google and look up the National Register. Look at the Burns Bottom Historic District, and this house will appear. It is on the National Register of Historic Places, and before any governmental body can do anything to harm it, they have to go through a permitting process with the State Department of Archives and History. Ward says he hates to see any historic home torn down, but sometimes understands it's necessary. However, he thinks this home could be saved. This is one of the oldest streets in town, and this is the last surviving antebellum home on this street. And if it were restored, even just cleaned up, it would be an asset and somebody would take it over. CRA is now working with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History to make sure they are doing everything by the book. Acker says that plans are still going to be on hold until the department gives them a green light to proceed with their plans to tear, tear down the home. Rather, Reporting live here in Columbus, Jory Talley, WCBI News. Thanks, Jory. Sheriffs in Pickens and Lamar counties are named in a lawsuit filed against 49 Alabama sheriffs. The Tuscaloosa News reports that the Southern Center for Human Rights and the Alabama Appleseed Center for Law and Justice announced the suit was filed Monday in Hale County Circuit Court. The groups are suing the sheriffs for not releasing records that show whether they've gained personal profit from jailhouse food programs. Under Alabama law, sher sheriffs can retain leftover money, food money, and some keep the money as income. The groups want a judge to order the sheriffs to release the requested documents. Give us your tuition, give us our tuition, or give us your taxes. That's the choice some Mississippi Community College students can make. A new law sitting on Governor Phil Bryant's desk will give community colleges a new way to collect past due tuition payments. Schools will be able to see state tax refunds of students who don't pay tuition or other debts owed to the two-year schools. Nationally, the default rate on two-year college loan and payments is just over 18%. If the governor signs the bill, it takes effect July 1st. The Mississippi House of Representatives pauses to pay tribute to a retired colleague. Former District 38 Representative Tyrone Ellis was honored for his 38 years of service in the state. 
state legislature, that is, during a ceremony this morning, his success, successor, Representative Sheck Taylor, introduced Ellis, highlighting his accomplishments during his tenure. Surrounded by family and supporters, Ellis addressed House members, recalling memories from the past 30-plus years. Ellis was also presented with a proclamation. Time now to turn things over to Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson with a first look at your forecast. Joey, lots of sunshine across our region right now. A live look in Columbus at 6.05. Looking back to the west, that ball of sun still in the sky. Mid-50s in a good chunk of our region. Columbus, though, a little bit warmer at 58. 7 o'clock, sunny, 50 degrees as an average. Through the 40s this evening, lows tonight, low 30s, and even some upper 20s. So we do expect a widespread freeze across northeast Mississippi and west Alabama, much like this morning. Tomorrow morning will be chilly, but we'll see more sunshine Wednesday afternoon back into the 50s. Warmer later this week, Joey. More in just a few minutes. Amory's library receives a big financial boost, and it can even be doubled with the community's help. WCBI's Ali Martin has more. This is really an exciting day uh, for Amory and the library. In James Smith's will, he left $250,000 to the Amory Municipal Library. The money was passed through his estate in Chicago to the CREATE Foundation in North Mississippi, establishing the James and Elizabeth Smith Endowment. A gift of this size will help the library continue its mission and advance in technology. I mean, a library today is not just checking out books. It's having computer access. Uh, we're even, uh, we, we've just gotten a 3D printer. Just the range of services you can provide for a community has just grown so much over time. Nobody really remembers James Smith. Once he left for Chicago in the mid-1940s, he spent his adult years there where he became successful in the world of finance and business. But his mother lived in Amory and was a frequent visitor to the library. I think this, this is really Jim saying, to his mother, I loved you so much, that, and you loved the library so much that I want to, in whatever way I can, I want to contribute back to the library. There's also an opportunity to double the gift through a challenge grant. If the community can raise $125,000, an additional $125,000 will be given through the fund. That's one of the real advantages of having an approach like this is that the fund will grow over time and maintain its spending power. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's, it's just a win-win for the, an organization and the community, and, and CREATE is just proud to be a partner. Claiborne estimates it will take about three years to raise $125,000 for that challenge grant. In Amory, I'm Allie Martin, WCBI News. When fully funded, the half a million dollar gift would produce about $20,000 a year for the Amory Library. Though it's a little chilly now, spring break tourism season is just around the corner. I'm Victoria Bailey, and we take a look at what area communities are doing to roll out the red carpet for visitors. Welcome to Mississippi. We'll be hearing a lot of that in the coming months. Thousands of visitors are making plans to head our way, drawn to North Mississippi for sports, festivals, and pilgrimages. Our Victoria Bailey learns more about how communities are planning to roll out the red carpet. She joins us live with more. That's right, Joey. This is just the beginning, and welcome centers like this one here in Columbus will be sharing the best of our community. It's that time of year again, spring tourism season, and places like Starkville and Aberdeen aren't sparing any hospitality. Um, it should be perfect time for the azaleas to be in bloom, and we look forward to everyone coming to visit. Well, we always gear up for a really strong spring, and we love it because we get so many people in. In the next few weeks, several springtime favorite events will be taking place, including the NIT and the NCAA basketball tournaments and the annual pilgrimage, which attracts tons of visitors to each place. 
Greater Starkville Development Partnership Tourist Director Jennifer Prather says this is a unique opportunity to market and promote the community. As we really make sure that we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's so that everybody's prepared and ready to put their best foot forward. We do focus on restaurant and retail because that's the, the industry that sees the biggest surge when you have weekends like an NCAA tournament. Um, and so we do sometimes put together special promotions just to have that extra push to push people into our restaurants and our stores while they're here. The community works together to come up with a plan of action to handle the uptick in traffic. We work with our restaurants and our merchants so that we can make sure with the influx of people that we have enough uh, diners open, uh, extra hours, um, extra manpower. A lot of our civic groups, garden clubs do luncheons, other things to kind of facilitate uh, while they're here. And then a lot of our stores will be open with specials, um, different things. Antique shopping is a big thing um, while the folks are here visiting our historic homes. We try to make their experience in Starkville the best one that they can have. So they're coming to a new community, but we want them to immediately feel right at home. So we are specifically working to put information in our hotels, Starkville magazines that have maps and lists of where to eat and where to shop um, and things that they can do while they're here. Robin says the town gets to enjoy all their visitors while receiving a financial boost. It's always an economic boost for us um, to have our visitors coming in. Um, they stay with us. They dine with us. Um, hopefully, um, several of them have actually come and seen houses and come back and purchased homes. And now they're our neighbors here. And so that's a wonderful aspect of it. April is pilgrimage month. Aberdeen's will begin April the 6th and Columbus will kick off April the 5th. For now, we're live in Columbus. I'm Victoria Bailey, WCBI News. Lots of sunshine across our region today. That's how it looked this morning in Artesia and parts of southwestern Lowndes County. You can see our lows tonight still very chilly. Low 30s and upper 20s around here. Not as cold farther south. We will moderate later this week. Full forecast details are next. Your first alert forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. So nice to see you on our Tuesday afternoon, almost evening. The freeze is likely tonight. We do have a freeze that will be possible tomorrow night. I think tonight's probably going to be the coldest night this week. Showers and storms return on Friday along with some warmer temperatures. Currently in Tupelo, 56 degrees. We have a wind from the west at 10 miles per hour. There are the flags whipping around. It's been a tad bit breezy out there today. Gusts over 20 in some instances, but that wind will relax once the sun goes down. So another hour or two, and then we should be home free. Temperatures across the Twin States, comfortable, especially farther south. They're in the low 60s. We've got 50s around here. Speaking of the wind, 10 to 15 miles per hour sustained with some higher gusts, but that is going to relax. High pressure is coming on in, and that means uh, a clear night, a sunny day tomorrow, sunny on Thursday, and we should be uh, looking at some uh, more Agitated weather, I guess you could say, Friday and uh, early next week with some more energy coming on in from the west. But uh, we'll see how it all plays out later this week. Clear and cold tonight. A freeze is likely. Protect your tender vegetation if you do have some. A lot of that has already sprouted because we were very warm a couple of weeks ago. But low 30s, if not upper 20s, uh, widespread across our region tonight. And here's our zone forecast for Wednesday. 53 in Tupelo, 51 in Corinth, 53 in Houston, 54 in Aberdeen, farther south, perhaps a few degrees warmer, mid to upper 50s along and south of 82, 57 in Columbus, and for you in West Alabama as well, widespread mid 50s with lots of sunshine. Wind not as strong from the northwest at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. So more 50s for us tomorrow, a little bit cooler in Huntsville and Memphis, around 50. If you're going south towards the coast, more in the way of middle 60s in Gulfport and Mobile. Here's our future cast, and there's high pressure coming on in, nice and quiet around here. Warmer on Thursday, we will actually have a southerly breeze, still sunny, but a southerly breeze will get us back into the upper 60s, if not to around 70. There's that disturbed weather coming on in for Friday, showers and storms in the forecast. We may see a few stronger storms, too. Still uncertain as far as the overall strong storm threat on Friday. Just stay tuned for some new information later this week. But uh, there's your forecast. Warmer by the weekend, perhaps Saturday, uh, or Saturday perhaps in some mid to upper 70s, with another shot at some better rain chances by early next week. There's your forecast. Sports is next after the break. WCBI Sports with Robbie Donahoe is brought to you by your local Ford dealers. Go further. 
As a number one seed, your chances of making it to the Final Four only increase in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Over the last decade, at least two number one seeds have made the Final Four in nine of the last ten NCAA Women's Tournaments, and all four have advanced to the Final Four twice. But numbers are just that. And there's a number in the loss column that's not a zero for Mississippi State following their loss to South Carolina in the SEC Tourney title game. But the Bulldogs turn the page rather quickly and have their sights set on the next game. We turned it as soon as we left, but we knew that we had work to get done. So, I mean, it's nothing that we overlooked, but we still have things to get done and learn from our mistakes in that game. I'm anxious to always play the next one. I'm always anxious to see how we respond this year after 32 wins and, and now after our first loss. So, um, you know, we've had some good work. Today was a really good workout, and uh, we had some time off, and uh, now we'll get ready to play. Mentally right now, we're focusing on one week at a time. We can't look to the national championship game. Um, you have to take it step by step, and I think for us right now, we're focusing on Nickel State and then um, whoever we're going to play on Monday. But um, right now, we're just focusing on fixing the problems that we had in the SEC championship because that's what's going to boost us forward um, in this next tournament. Bulldogs will play the Nichols Colonels on Saturday at 5 p.m. First game will be Oklahoma State-Syracuse games. will be on ESPN2, but the games are sold out, so if you don't have a ticket... You're going to be out of luck. You've got to find someone else who may have already bought tickets. Monday's game time, by the way, will be determined following Saturday's game. The men's team will be in action in the NIT tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. You can watch the game on ESPN2. We'll have more with the Bulldogs on their matchup with the Huskers coming up tonight at 10 for you on WCBI Sports. Well, leading candidate has emerged in the Ole Miss men's basketball coaching search. Middle Tennessee head coach Kermit Davis Jr. is the guy to beat for the Rebels head coach opening, according to multiple reports and confirmed here at WCBI. Although the coaching search is not is reportedly not yet completed, he's a native of Leakesville, Mississippi. Davis is a Mississippi State graduate, and he has deep ties to the Magnolia State. Well, have you filled out that bracket yet? Well, hopefully I can give you a little help. This is my annual time of year where I give you my bracket tips, opportunities, and a little help for you if you're filling it out or maybe just need a little tip here and there. Here's my second tip. Last night we talked about don't pick in the 16 seeds. Tonight, make sure you advance one of those first four past the round of 64. It's being played right now, the first four on True TV, but take a look at those 11 seeds lines. You can look at Oklahoma, Arizona State, teams like that, say Bonaventure or UCLA. Make sure you advance one of those teams to the round of 32 at the very least, because every year since the field expanded to 68, at least one of those first four teams has won multiple games in the tournament. That little wave of momentum you get after winning that first one has helped uh, pr just propel your team to the next round. So something to look forward to. There's brackets hit number two. We'll have number three coming up tonight at 10. Two moves in the NFL. Drew Brees is staying in New Orleans. The Saints quarterback will be signing a two-year deal worth approximately $50 million, according to multiple reports. The deal has $27 million guaranteed. Brees turned 39 in January. He'll be staying in New Orleans past his 41st birthday. By the way, Jimmy Graham is expected to sign with the Packers. There was a chance that he maybe was in the mix to get back to New Orleans, but that is no longer the case. And according to Adam Schefter, former Ole Miss Rebel Dante Moncrief will be departing Indianapolis. He'll be staying in the division. He'll be signing a new deal with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Moncrief was the third-round pick by the Colts in 2014, caught 96 passes over his first two years. Also, Malcolm Butler expected to be signing with the Tennessee Titans in a major deal. Five years, $61 million. Again, all these will be confirmed over the next coming days. That's it for sports. We'll be the last of your forecast. Cold tonight, cool tomorrow, cold again tomorrow night. And then the 70s return maybe on Thursday. Uh, probably a better chance by the weekend, but our next rain chance will be Friday. It's been nice this week, just cool. Yeah. Uh, we've been navigating things okay, just chilly nights and uh, comfortable days. 30 to 70, that's the reason my sinuses are driving me nuts. Some dry air really cools down and warms up. Mm -hmm. There you go. Indeed. All right, thanks, mm -hmm. Keith. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Have a good night.